This is episode number 235 with Camille Preswadic, and you're going to learn a lot about the Henchy colorist movement, the Provincetown theory of color, and uh, meet one of the people who has been carrying that forward. Uh, so we're going to we're going to have a great time today. Just hang with us. This is the Plan Air Podcast with Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plan Air Magazine. In the Plan Air Podcast, we cover the world of outdoor painting. Called Plan Air, the French coined the term, which means open air or outdoors. The French pronounce it Plan Air. Others say Plain Air. No matter how you say it, there is a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outdoors to paint. And this show is about that movement. Now, here's your host, author, publisher, and painter, Eric Rhodes. Hey there, Happy New Year. And this is the official first podcast of 2023. And we have a great way to kick off the new year. You're going to meet in a minute, Camille Preswadic. Uh, as an old friend of mine, we, have, we go way back way, way back. And we'll tell some of those stories. I'm sure. Um, I have met my goal. My goal was to make sure that I got out painting on the first day of the new year. And I am happy to say I can check that box. Now I just got to do it more often. I hope you're setting some goals. And if you are not setting goals, you're not going to reach them, right? So you got to have some goals. We'll talk about that in the art marketing podcast at the end of this, uh, coming up after the interview, we're going to actually uh, talk about how we hurt ourselves and the stories that we tell ourselves that actually hurt our ability to sell our art. And we're going to talk about some other things too in the, this week's Marketing Minute. And we are also very humbled to announce, I know it's hard for you to believe that I could possibly be humble, but, but we are humbled to announce that we are number one in the feed spot list of painting co podcast two years in a row. We just found out that we were number one for 2022. We were number one for 2021. And now we've got to earn it and see if we can become number one for 2023, which probably won't happen until the end of the year. So thank you for making that happen. Also want to thank all of you. A lot of you over Christmas time uh, bought subscriptions to Plen Air Magazine. If you are into outdoor painting or plein air collecting, uh, it's the place to be. And so what a great time to uh, get yours. If you don't have one yet, just go ahead and go to plenairmagazine.com. Also, uh, any day now, we're going to be doing something different at the Plein Air Convention this year. We, you know, we have done it. Uh, this will be our 10th Plein Air Convention. It would have been our 12th, but we had to cancel two years. Uh, because it's our 10th, we're going to pull out all the stops and do some big celebrating, some fun things, some different things, including we've invited a major uh, how do I say this without giving it away? Maybe I could say film, television, motion picture kind of person. Uh, I won't even say male or female uh, that you will be surprised to see. A lot of people are guessing. And so far, I've seen a lot of people guessing and they've all guessed it wrong. Anyway, we're going to have a big celebrity at the Plein Air Convention. It's going to be announced soon. Uh, of course, once we announce it, it'll sell out because it was sold out before. So uh, make sure that you uh, put this on your list, plenairconvention.com, and uh, just go. You will have a blast. It's kind of like Woodstock for artists. And speaking of uh, an event for artists, uh, coming up uh, in just a couple of weeks, we have Watercolor Live, which is officially the largest art conference in history. We have that many people on. And it's a massive worldwide audience, and we hope that you'll join us. Uh, we have 30 top watercolor instructors and some of the best of the best teaching. And because you're immersing yourself essentially for three days, you're going to get so much information into your subconscious mind that things are going to be happening. You won't even realize they're happening. So that's a good way to improve your, your watercolor work. Just go to watercolorlive.com. Now, my guest today is Camille Preswadic. She is an acknowledged authority on color. And you're going to learn a lot about color today. And she regularly serves 
as an entry and awards judge for various painting competitions events. She's a sought after instructor, teaches online. She has an advanced approach to teaching and seeing light and the keys of nature and expressing them through color relationships. And I have personally experienced that. We'll talk about this, but I personally got a chance to study every Monday with Camille for, I think it was like two years. And, uh, I didn't like a minute of it, but it was the best possible thing. And <laughs> we'll talk about that. Camille studied with an, an impressionist master, Henry Henschey, at the Cape Cod School of Art, at the Cape School of Art, and founded uh, was founded by Charles Hawthorne in Provincetown, Massachusetts. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Camille, welcome to the Plein Air Podcast. Mm, glad to be here. I, I'm I sorry hope I didn't you didn't enjoy. You. I'm sorry you didn't enjoy your time with me. <laughs> no, um, I enjoyed my time with you. I didn't enjoy the struggle. And what I mean by that is, is of course, what Camille does as part of her process is that she uh, sets up these colored blocks out in the sun, and then you have to paint them with a palette knife. I had never used a palette knife before. And it took me out of my comfort zone. And we did it over and over and over and over again for a couple of years. I remember saying to you, Camille, that I could we just go paint something, you know, because I wanted to learn how to paint. And you said, no, no, you need these skills. You just got to master this. You got to learn to see color. And you were right. You were absolutely right. They're the color scales. It would it's be like, it'd be like um, studying music and not doing your scales. I've had uh, the DreamWorks team, you know, they're animators, incredible artists. They've taken two workshops with me and I had them doing blocks and they were struggling and it was very, you know, it was hard for me too because they're such great painters. So it was challenging to teach them, but they understood the uh, importance of these blocks. I think the more advanced you are, the more you can appreciate. I, I see beginners saying, oh, I've done my blocks. You know, I don't need to do my blocks. But if you can't lay a block on a table, if you don't, your drawing skills aren't there, you're not going to be able to paint a bush or a house or whatever. So, you know, I can well, tell I, within I can tell within twenty within five minutes how experienced you are as a painter. Well, and I, I think it would be I have not done blocks since I did them with you, and that's been probably what do you think, fifteen years ago, probably mm -hmm. maybe more. More. And, and more, yeah, because I hadn't started Plein Air Magazine yet. And um, so that was well over 20 years ago. Yeah, really. And, and uh, I, I think it would be a really good thing to go back to it. You know, one of my early mentors told me to do at least one value painting, value study oh, painting every every year, just to kind of remind yourself about values. I would, I would think that the color keys would be the same approach as going back and reminding yourself because you know, I probably have lost more than I learned. Yeah. I, you know, it's important. Like if you're trying to paint green, a good exercise is to have several different greens, like a still life and try to paint the variation in those green colors or white. Uh -huh. um, but yeah. And what we say too, is if you are doing essentially value studies when you're doing the blocks, because what we say is if it's the right color, it's the right hue, the saturation, and the value. But we say hues on fur. And I say we because Dale, my husband, and I do a lot of the teaching. So uh -huh. he came out with the, uh, the hues on We say hues on fur. So color is even more important maybe than value. Well, let's, let's kind of roll back to that, where this all came from for you. You, you and uh, Dale, I think, were both... In school yeah, together? Dale studied longer than I did. He, I he, met Dale, and then he took me to Henchy. Okay, so let, tell that story so we understand how you got involved in this whole colorist thing. Well, you know, I was at the Academy of Art. I was studying illustration, and I was ready to take my portfolio out. And I was very tight, rendered. Um, the head of the department said I could teach rendering. And I reconnected with Dale and we started dating and he said, well, you know, I go back East studying with this guy, Henry Henchy, do you want to come with me? And I said, sure. And he didn't tell me anything like this is going to change your life, etc. We just went back there and all of a sudden I meet this master painter. You know, I was able to see all his paintings and I mean, I was blown away. 
And also the students, I was so impressed with the student work and I knew that it would take me years to get to their level. Uh -huh. So it was like right away I was sold. And luckily I had Dale uh, with me to, so I, we would study every summer for a couple of weeks. And then when I got home, I would work during the year and then go back and kind of, you know, take another class with him. So the, that, that changed everything. Of course, you had no idea. Oh, I came you, you back. Had, yeah. And you, you probably had no idea the weight uh, and the importance of, of Henshi. Uh, you know, we look at, we look back on him now and we go, wow. I mean, you, you got a chance to study with him and what a master and you probably, for you, he's probably just another guy in the beginning. No, no, no. Oh, I was you knew? totally, I, I, I was totally sold <laughs> and I knew I was going to be a part of art history and, um, you know, he changed my life. So I came back to the Academy of art and I didn't know anything. I was just throwing color around and, um, you know, it took me years to develop as a colorist. I mean, I could only initially only paint sunny days. I didn't know how to paint a gray day. I didn't know different light keys. Um, so it took me years to develop into a, a decent colorist. And, and that starts by learning to see color. How, right. how does one learn to see color? Because that, I found that very difficult in the beginning. You find a guide. <laughs> like me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, well, you know, there's there's people that do teach color. There's two major colorist movements. There's the Sergei Bongard and the Henry Henry Hawthorne uh, color movements. And uh, either of those two movements, I think, can teach you color. Um, and when I say color, color in the tradition of Monet. So what mm -hmm. you're trying to do is to paint the different light keys of nature. And by this, I mean sunny day, early morning, midday, late afternoon, gray days. Um, and it even changes with geography. You're going to have a cooler light in Laguna Beach as opposed to Petaluma. Petaluma has a warmer light because of the water in the air. You go to the desert, you're going to have more of an orange tone to the color. So the only way to learn these things, I think you need a guide initially, but is to go out there and try to capture that light key of nature. And it takes lots of practice. Um, I remember trying to paint aerial perspective the first time. It was daunting. I mean, I was like miserable, but you know, it took me years to finally be able. And when I say aerial perspective, it's like the air, you're essentially painting air. Yeah. Well, that's something David LaFell talks about is that you, until you learn to paint air, you're really not a good painter. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so I, I agree. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, <clears throat> do, do you have any, any real aha moments that you remember taking away from Henchy? <clears throat> Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> I'm just, he was never complimentary. Um, so it was hard studying with him and I saw people walking away. Um, the aha moments was like, let's say I'd be working on a still life all morning. He didn't even show up to about 11 or 12. And, you know, everybody's saying, oh, Henchy's coming, Henchy's coming. I'm thinking, oh my God, here comes Henchy, you know? So the person next to me, he says, you know, you should work on your composition. And I thought, oh my God, I haven't even thought about my composition. So he comes to me and I go, oh, I haven't even thought about my composition. He said, oh, you're too stupid. Forget about the composition. Your color's terrible. Then he would take a little bit of blue, a little bit of yellow, a little bit of red, and the whole color balance would change. The amount of color that he used was so minimal, but he knew exactly where to put it. And that's what a master is. Made a huge difference. How long did it take you to really get good at being a colorist? Um, well, you know, I was doing decent, I guess, decent paintings. Um, five, six years into it, but I was very limited and I was over coloring. My stuff was very um, saturated. Everything was saturated. There was a lot of um, dioxazine purple. Um, I would say 20... 20 years, but I was an illustrator, so I couldn't work full time on developing myself as a painter. You know, uh -huh. I had jobs to do. I had commissions. 
So I think it would have taken me less if I could paint every day. Well, that's that's the big thing, isn't it? I mean, I, I, I remember watching Richard Lindenberg. You know Richard. Yeah. And, and Richard had gone from being employed full-time to being unemployed and going to being a full-time artist. And once he did that, about two years later, he had he had grown, you know, 200% mm-hmm. because he was mm-hmm. just doing it full-time. That makes a, yeah. a big difference if you can. Well, so I, what, got up, I got up one day. I was an illustrator. I had a rep in New York. And I, you know, the whole industry had changed because the computers, a lot of the art directors were using computers. Crappy jobs were coming in. I was bidding. I wasn't painting. So I got up one day and I said to Dale, I'm quitting my job as an illustrator. And I was the main earner. And I said, uh, I know this is the right thing to do. So I stopped doing illustration. I called my rep. I said, I don't want any more work. And the first day on location, I took my easel. I'm painting. One hour into my painting, uh, an attorney in Petaluma came up and said, I love your work. I'd love to buy a painting from you. What would you charge to do a painting of my Julia Morgan house? Uh I said, well, you can't art direct me, but I'll come and I'll do some studies. And if you find one that you like, the, let's see, I said, I had to think quickly, a 16, 12 by 16 is 1200. So the first day on location, I sold a painting for $1,200. (laughs) And never looked back. So then I came home and Dale said, how was your day on, you know, at the office? I said, I sold a painting today for 1200, but, and you'll appreciate this. I took my $20,000 advertising budget and immediately put it into fine art for my illustration. I immediately put it into fine art and started advertising and started building a career. You know, we've talked about this in the past. Um, The reason I discovered you is you were advertising in, uh, American um, Art Review. American Art Review. And I was a subscriber. This is way before I ever started the magazines or, or I was barely painting. And I saw you week after or month after month after month after month. And it it created this impression of you as being somebody who uh, was really, really important. Now, I didn't know you from Adam. I didn't know if you were important or not. But because of, of those ads over and again, I just, I assumed you were important. Of course, I found out you are, but it, and then, and then there was one time that I saw in there, you know, workshops available and I I saw Petaluma. I thought I'm going, I'm close. And that's how we initially connected. But I, I, you know, let's just touch on that. You know, this is more of an art marketing thing, but let's touch on that because I think it's so important because uh, you saw something that you had done in your previous career and just changed it. But a lot of artists, you know, that takes a lot of courage to be able to say, I'm going full-time. And by the way, if I'm going to go full-time, I have to act like a professional and, and advertise. Do you want to touch on that? Well, I think you have to believe, I think you have to have your skill level to a certain point. You don't have to be perfect, but you have to have a product, a good product. Right. Although I think you could sell anything, but I would prefer having a good product. And then you, um, and it's daunting, you know, people say, oh, I got a frame. I got it. You know, there's so much. So you have to start somewhere. You can get free advertising. You can send press releases to like local newspapers. And then once you sell a painting, you give a percentage to, you know, maybe doing some local advertising. You keep building on something and eventually you can do national, national advertising. I mean, now it's social media. It's a completely different uh, way of promoting. Right. So um, I think, and then ask other artists, you know, you can ask other artists. Um, I was an illustrator, so I understood promotion. So I really you know, when I got into fine art, I really knew, you know, you have a product, then you got to sell it. I mean, it's that simple. A lot of artists say, oh, I don't want to think about my art that way. Well, that you do have a product and you do have to figure out the marketplace for that product. So the other thing I tell artists is if you have an open, let's say you have an open studio and you don't sell anything, you have to take time. You don't change your art and start doing little tchotchkes for $50, you're gonna build, you have to get more people in, you have to build your audience. So you may not sell the first time, 
But the more you have these open studios, the more you get your work out there, you're going to attract uh, collectors. So you really have to believe in your product. Don't paint to the marketplace. Just do a really good painting and you will find a market for it. How do you know when you're ready? I think you could ask other artists, um, you know, what kind of feedback are you getting? Um, I would ask other artists, you know, that you respect. Yeah, as long as they'll tell you the truth. Well, I'll tell you the truth. No, I yeah, I have no question you would tell the truth. <laughs> and I have students coming every Monday, and I, you know, I give them, they come for critiques. Yeah, well, that's important. You've got, and it's, it's painful, but you've got to have it. it. Other people walk out, you know, yeah. but, but my core, my core group, they want to improve their painting. So I just say, this is my opinion, you know. You can get other opinions, and I've actually had people thank me for my brutal, my brutal um, critiques because, you know, what are we here for? We want to improve. I want people to give me those kind of critiques. Well, I don't think you get any value. You know, there are oftentimes instructors who will look for nice ways to say things or try to look for something nice. But, you know, if you can cut to the chase and just give somebody permission to just be fully honest, you're going to get so much more out of it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, yep. I mean, I'm not mean about it. I mean, when I no. first started teaching, I would say, you will do it like I, I mean, I was a lot <laughs> stricter. I've like mellowed out. Um, but, you know, I mean, they're, they're here to learn. And, the, you know, it's what I'm teaching is not easy to learn. So I think, you know, I've got to be tough on them. You mentioned uh, Sergei, Sergei Bongart, uh, the mm -hmm. Russian did you ever do any study with him? I'm curious what the, the difference is between colorist for his group and colorist for No, Mitchell. but I've painted with Dan Pinkham. I've painted with Ned Mueller. And, you know, I've painted with a lot of uh, Sergei students. Um, they're capturing that light key, you know, that's, and I can have a conversation with a Sergei student about light key. Most other plein air painters, unless you've studied with either Henchy or uh, Sergey, can you have that conversation? Because it's important to us, you know, that's number one, getting that light key of nature. So who, who are, you mentioned Dan Pinkham. Uh, I, I just found his work to be so remarkable. Mm -hmm. Who are some of your inspirations? Well, I, you know, Dan Pinkham, Sir, uh, Soroya, of course. Um, and then there was one painting, Joe Paquette, um, I, I, uh, prom I provided that, that painting I saw on Instagram. I was just, wow. I love that painting. And what was it about it? Was it the light? The light, the drawing, the composition. It's, it's, it's just one of those paintings that stopped me. Yeah. And that doesn't happen a lot to yeah. be honest with you. Um, well, and you get to see a lot of, a lot of variety on Instagram. Yeah. But that painting really, um, and you know, I was talking, um, I tell people, okay, so I can teach you how to paint, but it's going to take years for you to find your vision. So, you know, I studied with Henchy, but I think I found my own vision. I mean, Henchy was Henchy. I'm Camille, you know, passing on the tradition. So what I tell students to do is I keep a book, you know, and these have, it has like all, you know, if I go through a magazine and something inspires me, I cut it out and I put it in this book. And then I tell students, look at that. Not that you're going to copy these artists, but there's something about their work that inspires you. And that's a key to who you are as a painter. Well, it's and that'll help you see patterns. Yeah. And what you, you know, what you choose to paint how you choose to paint it. You know, I have several students that are now professional, beautiful colorists. And what I love to see is they're all different. Yeah. They've really so they're not found, mimicking you. Yeah, they found their own vision, but that's going to take years to find that vision. So does it find you? I mean, do you, does it just kind of one day you go, oh, uh, that's it? I, I think it uh, takes a lot of introspection, writing, it's a deep, it's a deep conversation that you have with yourself. And I had that conversation about 10 years ago because I was painting so much. I mean, I have so many paintings. It's, I, you know, I'm trying to get rid, you know, get rid of, 
you know, toss a lot of them. I've done so much painting, but I got to a point in my life that I was like, why do you paint? It's not just about laying paint anymore. It is, who are you? You know, what are you, what are you trying to say? And I almost stopped painting. I really had to go internally. I got into therapy and uh, actually came back and said, okay, I'm going to do uh, wetlands because I think they're important. They're kind of like my water lilies. Uh -huh. And I started painting wetlands all over. And I'd go down to the Laguna and I'd paint the back bay. And uh, so now when I paint, I really write about what I'm painting, why I'm painting. It's much deeper than just covering canvas. I mean, I've done enough covering can miles of, I have miles of canvas. And I think mm -hmm. that's important, but there's a point that you get to where you really have to go deep and find out who you are, why you paint, why is it relevant to you? Do you think doing that made you a better painter? Oh yeah, no, no, no doubt about it. So would, would an expert be able to look at Camille 10 years ago and Camille today and be able to tell a distinct difference? Yeah, you can go on my website and there's a uh, progress, not perfection. It's a blog. And I have a painting of vineyards and a painting of a house done in 1991 and one, two that I did of the similar subject matter. It's not even the same painter. Oh, huh. that's exciting. Yeah, it's. So what, what is the process? If, if knowing what you know today with the, the decades of experience, uh, you've got a lot of people who are listening to this all over the world who are kind of at the early stages and they're, uh, they're saying to themselves, how do I get there? How do I get there as fast as possible? Because that's what everybody wants to do. What What is the process you would recommend to them? Because I, I think that a lot of us go down these roads and they, they, they don't lead to anything. And, you know, because maybe we get a bad instructor or we get some bad advice What's your best advice? Um, find somebody that inspires you because you've got to figure out what kind of painting you want to learn. And I don't think you're going to just take a bunch of workshops because you're just going to confuse yourself. But you've got to find out, you know, there's a difference between Richard Schmidt and me. You know, do you and I've had students that said, I want to study with somebody that studied with Richard Schmidt. I'm more interested in that way of painting. You've got to find the kind of painting that you really are inspired by. And then you have to find somebody that's a good teacher, because a lot of people are good painters, but they're not good teachers. And you can ask students, you know, how was that workshop? Did you get anything out of that workshop? Then you, you find a guide. You find somebody that can get you there much quicker because if you're doing it on your own, practice makes permanent. So if you're practicing incorrectly, you're not going to get anywhere. I don't care how much you paint. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can find somebody to get you there. And then it's practice. It's just, I think it's um, probably 10% talent and 90% just stick to itiveness. You know, just keep doing it. Apply and uh, try to keep in, try to keep inspired. I think especially when people are learning, you, you're frustrated, you know, but I, you know, I've so, told students I've been in workshops where I've cried and I just go back, come back in and keep at it. You know, nobody's going to stop me. I mean, I'm, you know, you got to be tough too. You can't, you can't be like, oh, somebody said I, they didn't like my work. Oh, I'm going to quit. <laughs> Forget it. This business is too, it's, it's very challenging and if you're that weak or that, you know, sensitive, I don't think this is the, you know, you're not going to get out there and market your work because it's, it's a hard, you know, it's, it's tough out there. And if you're putting art, if you're putting painting, like I say to my students, learn perspective, learn good values, learn good color. Because if you put a painting out there that's terrible or has bad, poor perspective, artists know that, you know, they're going to, you know, you're going to get a bad reputation. Well, and collectors may not know it, but the, something doesn't feel right. To them. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. And, and what about the person who's been painting for 10 or 15 or 20 years, but they're just, they're just not feeling it. Or maybe they're like, you know, they just don't feel like they've made the progress. They, they have really good basic skills, but they, they just feel like they need to, they, they need to change or give up, you know, that kind of, 
I've been in that moment. Well, I was there like, 10 years ago. So. Yeah. So what's the process you recommend for them? Well, I would find some artists maybe to paint with that you're inspired by, you know, talk to other artists. I think that's, you know, really what you need to do. Um, go to museums, you know, read a, you know, look at some paint, some uh, art books, um, you know, write about it. Um, and also, you know, you were talking about, I think it's also whatever you, and I've seen this in my life, you know, make plans like 10 year plans or what I want to do. Like when I quit my job as an illustrator, I said, I want to paint with the best planner painters in the country. You know, I had goals and I've reached most of those goals. And in one of my uh, podcast or one of my reels, I said, oh, my goal for um, 2023 is to sell more paintings and to become a better painter. And somebody said, you know, wrote, oh, how you couldn't become a better, you know, and I'm like, if I was not trying to grow, I would stop painting. Yeah. There's no reason to just keep repeating myself. I'm always looking at my work. I'm always trying to improve my work. And, you know, you, you have to be honest with yourself. What are your strengths? You know, people, and when you have people come into your studio, you'll get feedback on your work. Well, uh, you know, I, I, I mentioned this previously, maybe on another podcast or something. I, I've been watching CW Monday and yeah. I didn't think he could get much better, quite frankly. And then he took a year off from painting and he went and taught kids at the Indianapolis museum. And then he came back and he started painting and he painted differently and he became better because he, he, he just had a year to think yeah. about it. He just separated himself. I think sometimes getting away really makes yeah. it. Yeah. I think, and you know, I paint smart now. I just don't paint just to paint. I really have to plan on why I'm, why I'm, what I'm painting, why I'm painting it. And I kind of plan it. So how much, um, how much are you going outdoors? Are you still doing that on a regular basis? Well, I do Monday, my Monday class I, and I post those, um, those demos on my, uh, on Instagram and on YouTube. Um, it depends, you know, I'll take a whole week maybe and plan. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do some studies and I'm doing more work in the studio now. Uh huh. Well, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's not For a right. A while, or wrong. I didn't think I could, but, um, cause you want to try to get the same kind of feeling on your studio work that you do on your, uh, outdoor painting. And Are that's you doing studio work from studies. Uh, studies from reference. Yeah. But, and, and from photos, Fo photos. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's, that's one I haven't figured out yet is because I can see the glow of the sunlight when I'm out there, but I can't see that glow in the same way on a photograph. Yeah. Well, I don't copy a photograph. So you're just, you're just looking for, I bring to the photograph what I've learned painting on location for 35 years. Yeah. I don't copy a photograph. And that's the key. And then keeping the same energy. It's, ch it's challenging. <laughs> well, you've certainly accomplished a high level. So that's, it's certainly been worthwhile. I remember the first, um, this was probably about three years ago. I did a, um, a painting from a photograph. This is, you know, I usually worked on location and I did a painting, well, I worked from photographs a lot in the illustration, but I did a painting from a photograph. It was the dead, it was a dead painting. And I yeah. show my students this. It was like, oh, great, I can't work from a photograph anymore. But over time, I actually have accomplished that my, my paintings from photographs don't look like they were done from a photograph. Because you spent so much time outdoors doing yeah. it. But it took a while for me to make that transition. Are you still doing mud heads? You were doing a lot of figures. Oh, yeah. Work. No, I, I just did that one. I think I won, I won uh, the best figure portrait in the plein air salon on a, on a mud head that I did, a developed mud head. Would you but, explain what a mud head is for people who might um, not know? Hawthorne used to take the, um, the students out or the models out and put them against the ocean or the water and that water was in light and the, the face faces were in shadow and they had, they were so dark that they had the appearance of mud. So this is, um, I don't know if we can even do this, but this is, this is a developed mud head. 
But so what I'm what I'm just going to say that for the people listening in audio only, there's a video version, and and Camille is showing a a painting that she did, uh, which started with a mud head. So the face is in complete shadow, and a little reflected light. So you start there. You start with this big the big mass. And then eventually you add, you know, the, the features, but it's uh, really getting that flesh note dark enough so it stays in the shadow. So he called them mud heads. Uh, to me, one of the most difficult things that I haven't figured out yet is painting, <coughs> uh, painting a scene that's mostly in shadow with, you know, just some highlights of light. To It just, it, I don't know why, I, maybe I have a mental block about it, but do you have any tips on painting in shadow? Well, you want to keep your values together. You have shadow and light, but maybe you're not using definite color notes, identifiable color notes. So shadows to me are different color notes. Yeah. So instead of having them, you know, dark, you want to have identifiable colors. Like that's a blue or that's a green blue, a red blue, a purple, a blue purple, a red, you know, that those shadows have definite color that you can identify those colors. Yeah, that's and that's part of the training that I've kind of lost that I probably should go back to and, mm-hmm. and study some of those blocks. So I want to tell real quickly um, the story of the foundation of Plein Air Magazine because I give you credit for uh, having a big, big part of inspiring me to create it. And do you want to tell your version of it? Well, my version is you were coming to uh, my class. Little did I know that you were a publisher. Um And you came to me and, you know, asked me about, you had an idea to start a magazine, Plein Air. And I thought, wow, you know, that's perfect. And I encouraged you because, well, that's what I was doing, you know, and we didn't really have a, we didn't have a Plein Air magazine. So, and it was such a big movement that uh, I definitely encouraged you. Well, and and thankfully you did, uh, because I don't know if I would have gone down that path without it course you know we we started it we kept it going for two or three years then it failed because we couldn't get any advertising because if you remember everybody said you know there's uh the plein air doesn't deserve to be in galleries <laughs> and, and uh the art materials people said well nobody paints in plein air so we we can't make any money on advertising your magazine things have sure changed in the last 20 years but see you didn't give up so it's that stick to that yeah. is your success. Well, and- I, I almost got forced into giving up because I was near bankruptcy. <laughs> and uh, my bookkeeper came in and said, you can't continue to go down this path. And so I changed, if you remember, I changed Plein Air into Fine Art Connoisseur. Right, right. And, that, and Fine Art Connoisseur this year is celebrating its 20th anniversary. Mm-hmm. So Plein Air right. is probably about 20, started about 22 or 23 years mm-hmm. ago. So, but yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't give it up because it was in my craw, you know, it was something mm-hmm. that I love so much. I just, it, it wasn't about publishing. It was about the movement and supporting mm-hmm. the movement. And, you know, I mean, it, you think back to 20 years ago, what wasn't available and, mm-hmm. and how few shows there were. And now look at how it's changed. Mm-hmm. It's just incredible. And I just want to say, I was one of those people out there painting and you people sure. go, what? what is she doing? You know, <laughs> it's like, what is she doing out there? You know? Yeah. So there was me with my easel and I did some of the first plein air movements too. I mean, shows the, the shows, but yeah, it's grown. It's incredible that it's lasted as long as it has. Well, we've got to figure out how to keep it going. And, and uh, the thing we have to be concerned about is that it's eventually you and I are going to age out or worse. And <laughs> <laughs> and you know we've got to make sure. We Sayonara, yeah. Plenty, yes, yeah, Sayonara, baby. <laughs> I hope I hope I keep you know this. I said just keep me alive as long as I you know I can think, but you know I'm out of here if I can't. And, and the minute you can't, put a little turpentine in your drink. Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, Camille, this has been a real joy. Uh, time flies when you're having fun, and we'll have to do this again sometime. But uh, okay. thank you for your inspiration. Um, your website is preswodek.com. It's P R Z E W O D E K.com. And if you, you look to the show notes, we'll make sure we have it on there too. 
And you can follow Camille uh, at Preswatic on uh, Instagram. And there's lots of other things you can do with Facebook and otherwise, but follow her on Instagram. You've been very active on Instagram lately. Yes, I have. That's my new thing. Yeah. I have an Instagram angel and she comes every Wednesday and we get seven reels together that I post during the week. So every uh -huh. day I post a reel and a still. See, one thing oh. about you that I really like and respect is if you don't know the answers you go to somebody who does know the answers i remember there was a time when you were like getting help building your website and you know you know reinventing your business you you know you don't have to be the person who invents it all which i think is smart yeah yeah well, well i think you. yeah i do okay and thank you eric for keeping this movement alive and everything you do and i will see you at the plein air convention Oh, exciting. Yeah, I can't wait. we got a big yeah. celebrity coming. I can't even yeah, tell you. Yeah, that's what I hear. <laughs> All right. Thanks, okay. Camille. All right. That was Camille Preswadic, and what a fabulous person she is. And, and I owe everything to her. I, I really uh, would not be in this position today, wouldn't be publishing art magazines, doing art conferences, doing art retreats, doing any of this if it had not been for Camille's inspiration and encouragement. and you know, she said, and I think this is an important point. She said that she didn't know what I did for a living. I didn't say, you know, I wasn't trying to be talking about what I did for a living. I just was, you know, trying to learn how to paint and somebody who's in your class or somebody you're hanging out with or somebody that you're able to impact might be somebody who's a world changer and all they need is your encouragement. So I want to thank Camille again for that. Make sure you follow her on Instagram and, and Facebook. Now I think it's time to go into the marketing minute. This is the marketing minute with Eric Rhodes, author of the number one Amazon bestseller, make more money selling your art, proven techniques to turn your passion into profit. In the marketing minute, I try to answer your marketing questions. Uh, I learned marketing, the hard way, uh, I didn't have anybody to teach me. It just kind of was experimentation. And I had a lot of failed mistakes, a lot of disasters, wasted a lot of money, did a lot of stupid things. And uh, so I'm trying to share what I've learned. I've tried to make myself a student of marketing for the last 30 plus years. And uh, so I don't necessarily approach things the way other art marketing people might. And that's not necessarily good or bad. It's just different. So if you have questions, you can send them to me, artmarketing.com slash questions. You can go and actually produce a video there, or you can email me, eric at artmarketing.com. Uh, I'm going to read the questions today because Amadine, uh, my producer, is a little under the weather. The first question is from Valerie Lovell Grazelli. I'm sorry, I probably butchered your name, in Phoenix. Should I start an LLC or get a business license before considering selling my art? I'm really stuck on the business side of things. Well, Valerie, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an accountant. I can't give you sound advice on tax matters and licensing matters and things like that. But that's why there are pros out there who can answer those questions. And I have to go to those people too, because I don't possess all of that knowledge. But when I launch a business and I have launched... 30, 40, 50 businesses, probably. Uh, some of them have been really big, you know, big, well-funded, uh, venture capital-funded businesses. Some have been startups. But when I launch a business, whenever I possibly can, I try to test things out before I get commitment. Now, you can't always do that. You know, if I'm going to a venture capital firm, I can't go to them and say, hey, I have an idea and I don't know how much money it's going to make. They're going to ask you to, to be a little bit more buttoned down than that. And they're, but they're not going to invest in artists. So I wouldn't worry about that. But, you know, I, I like to uh, get a feel for whether or not it has a chance of success before I start building out infrastructure. So I oftentimes will do some marketing tests. Uh, I'll put it out there, see if people are interested in it. Then, then sometimes I'll contact them and say, hey, thanks for your interest. I've decided not to do it. Or sometimes they'll say, thanks for your interest. I am going to do it, but it's going to take me a year or two years or five years or whatever. And so I like to test it. In your particular case as an artist, I think the a starting point is you got to find out if your work is good enough and are you able to sell any art? Now, if you're selling art now, 
you, you already know what to do. You just have to move forward to the next level. But if you're not selling art yet, then don't start a corporation. Don't get a license. Don't set up bank accounts uh, and then find out that nothing's going to sell. I, I think you need to find out if it's going to sell first. So the alternative is to test, right? And I, again, I may be giving you wrong advice, but you know, I think you know there are a lot of people who would sell something on eBay and you may have to claim it on your taxes. I'm not suggesting you shouldn't, but you sell a painting or two or five or 10 or 20, and then you find realize that you've got a business here. That's when you want to build your business structure. So test the waters. Um, now, there's all kinds of things you've got to keep in mind too. Uh, for instance, you know, business, business is simple structure, but it can be overwhelming. So for instance, um, you know, there are different types of corporations and a good lawyer can walk you through those. I started to make a mistake one time. I was going to set up a different type of corporation and my lawyer pointed out to me, don't do that. And I had gotten some bad advice from somebody, but he said, don't do that because you'll get doubly taxed. <clears throat> I didn't realize that. So I set up a sub S corporation so I don't get doubly taxed. But uh, you know, there's a lot of different things and they serve different purposes. The purpose for a corporation, quite frankly, is you want to have structure, but you also have liability issues and you have to be able to take care of those liabilities. And a, a corporation will protect you in theory if you have, um, you, you know, you do something where somebody gets hurt or damaged or killed or, you know, whatever. That's not likely to happen in the art world unless maybe they eat your paint at a workshop. <clears throat> Just saying. So find experts and don't be stuck. Um, you know, the hard stuff is finding a way to sell. Uh, the easier stuff is finding a structure because you can go online and find somebody who can teach you all that. And by the way, you can find most of the advice online and then just set up your corporation or whatever. The next question comes from Aaron Opi in California. Aaron says, how do we engage more people? I feel like there's a section of people who buy art but most people don't. People who already buy are the eyeballs everybody's trying to get in front of, and they are already oversaturated. But what about those who have disposable income but are con content to hang a factory-made live, laugh, love sign on their walls instead of fine art? Uh, can they be uh, awakened? He said, woken up. Can they be awakened or engaged to see how fine art can enrich their lives. Boy, there's about 30 questions in there, Aaron. Great questions. I'm going to break them down in smaller chunks. Um, so regarding how do we engage more people, it's a natural question. And I often fall into this trap, and it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's not necessarily the right question. The right question isn't how do I engage more people. The right question is how do I sell more art? And if you ask yourself the right question, you get different answers because the answers to how do I sell more art might be engaging more people, but they might not be. You see, there are two primary ways. There's more ways, but there are two primary ways to make money, and that is to uh, get new customers or to get old customers to spend more or buy again. So let's play it out for a minute. Let's say you have about 150 people who bought art from you over the past, oh, say, three years. Um, some would say, myself included, would say they're probably better prospects than new customers. Why? Because they're already sold on you. They already are aware of you. They know your art. They like your style. They've invested in buying something from you. They already own it. So the hard work of selling them on you and your art is over. You don't have to do that. So the only challenge is then how do you get them to buy more art? And that's easy in my mind. I've got all that in my book. Um, how do you convert a person who has one painting to becoming a multiple painting collector? Um, now you could do it now. Uh, so ask yourself this, uh, how do I sell more than one painting uh, this year? If you sold a hundred percent of them, one more, and you painted 150 paintings this year, you wouldn't need to sell anyone new. Now, selling 100% is unusual because most people don't sell 100% of anything and people's circumstances changes. The people who are your collectors might have died or gotten sick or downsized or moved or gotten divorced or uh, lost their jobs, whatever. Uh, but 
you could sell 10% of them uh, another painting, and some of those would buy more than one. So the odds are pretty good. And so I'd start there, ask yourself the question, how do I sell more paintings? And how do I sell more paintings to the people who've got them? Because once you get into going after new audiences, now you got to sell them on you. You got to find ways to reach them. You got to expose them to your work. Yeah, you know, you've got to convert them from a, uh, from a looker to an interested person uh, to a buyer. And so um, that that's tougher, quite frankly. Now, the second part of your question is that people who already buy, you say, are the eyeballs everyone is trying to get in front of, and they are already saturated. I got to tell you, this is a story that you're telling yourself. I don't know where that story comes from. But unless you have data to support that, because everything's always about data, especially in marketing, unless you have data to support that, you're making an assumption. And it's probably an incorrect assumption. I don't mean to embarrass you, please. But be careful about the stories that you tell yourself. The story isn't true. There are lots of people who buy art and buy it frequently and buy more and more and more. I know lots of them, and I hear stories like, I tell myself I'm not ever going to buy any more art, then I see something I fall in love with, and I buy it anyway, you know, and I have no room on my walls, but I'm building another room. I actually have some friends who built a bigger house with a bigger room just so they could house more paintings. So there are lots of people out there that buy art. You've got to figure out how to get in front of them and how to target them, and, you know, that that's that's easy really now the next part of the question is about those who have quote unquote disposable income but are content to hang a factory made live love laugh sign on their walls instead of fine art can they be woken up or engaged to see how fine art can enrich their lives well here's a news flash aaron every person who buys original art did not used to buy it Every person has a first time. How do you be that first time? Well, there are lots of first times. Um, Maybe you're selling people now and you're their first times. But, you know, I don't think people run around thinking about art. Most people don't. We do. Uh, They're not thinking about, is that an original or is that a print? They see something in Target they like and they go, oh, that's beautiful. I'll buy it. It's, oh, it's $75 and it's a print in Target. And I, by the way, have some beautiful prints that I got at Target. They're just beautiful boat prints, right? So you can be frustrated over that, but if people, it makes people happy, that's okay. Now, I know people who are billionaires who have prints in their house. And I know billionaires who have original paintings in their house. And I know billionaires who have both in their house. So it's something that they love. But once you get exposed to original paintings, and you see the difference of them in your house, then, you know, you fall in love with it and you want more and more of them. That's what happened to me. And so uh, I believe that, you know, there are a lot of people out there that you can target who are going to buy paintings from you. You you have a big uphill battle trying to convert people who buy prints at Target to spending, you know, bigger money on original art, although your art might be the same price. You never know but you got to get in front of them somewhere. And a lot of people wander through art shows and tent shows, and they've never bought a piece of art. I bought my first piece of art ever uh, as a tourist in New Orleans from a street artist. And then the second piece of art ever from a street artist in France. So those are unusual. But um, my saying is that you stand in the river where the money is flowing. Another way of saying it is stand in the river where art is selling. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. People like me survive by building audiences of art buyers. Uh, I have an audience, for instance, Fine Art Connoisseur. Uh, You know, I have 310 billionaires that read it. Quite frankly, if nobody else read it, those are probably enough to survive on. But, you know, there's thousands of people who read it that some of them buy art, some of them don't. And... They, you want to go into places where there are concentrated audiences. And, and there's nothing wrong with marketing on, on social media because people who are following artists like artists, and a lot of artists also buy art. Uh, but you also have to understand that you're not necessarily going to reach concentrated levels of collectors there. You might on a LinkedIn collectors group, or you might find other ways to, to reach out to collectors. And by the way, not everybody who buys art or consider themselves collectors. 
So anyway, I think the idea is why does something sell and how do I sell more of it? Um, I have, you know, I have magazines and newsletters. We deal with a lot of artists. I have a lot of artists who advertise. I have a lot of galleries who advertise. But I can tell you one thing. I can have two people in the same magazine, and one will sell the painting and the other one won't. So when they, it doesn't sell, of course, it's my fault, right? But then why does the other one that has the equal size ad, equivalent price, equivalent type of painting, why does that one sell? And I think a lot of that goes down to, first off, it's personal choice. Somebody sees something they like, they might buy it. Somebody is reminded of it, they might buy it. But it also goes deeper than that. A lot of people will have uh, what I call brand preferences. If I say to you right now, uh, what's a fast food company that you think of, you might immediately think of a company. Maybe it's McDonald's, right? And uh, that isn't necessarily we're going to eat, but that's what you think of. But if I said to you, if you came into a million dollars today and you could buy any historic artist, who would you buy? You're going to have someone in the top of your mind. And there are people out there who track contemporary artists and they say, you know, if I, you know, I get a bonus at work this Christmas or next Christmas, then they might say, well, I would, uh, I would love to buy, you know, this person's painting. And the reason that those people are on that person's list is because it's about top of mind awareness. And that boils down to branding and always being there. Now, this is story about this guy. Um, uh, he. Uh, he came into some money. I don't know how he came into some money, but he uh, picked up the magazine and he flipped through the magazine and he had some artists in there that he was looking for that he always thought, if I get some money, I'm going to buy this artist. And one of them was in there and the other one wasn't. He That other artist had been in the last issue and this artist uh, or this person called the artist and said, hey, can, is that painting still available? And he bought the painting. But the other, he didn't bother to go to the website of the other artist. Instead, he just kept flipping through the magazine. He saw something else he liked. It was something new. So maybe it was a brand he knew, didn't know. I don't know. But he ended up buying that instead. And and so that's why, you know, having that constant presence, even if you can't afford a big presence, have a small presence so that you're there. because. You know, what happens a lot is somebody will buy an ad in a magazine that they're featured in and they'll, you know, they'll put a, put a big full page ad in there about the, you know, themselves because they're in a story. And then somebody will think about that and they'll go, you know, I kind of like that. And then they're not thinking about you anymore. And the next time around, the next magazine comes out and you're not in there, but they might be thinking, hey, I, you know, remember I saw that magazine. I don't know where it is, but maybe that artist is in here. And so we actually find that when you're in there the second time, it, it actually has a, a, a good chance of success as well. So the idea is being there frequently. Anyway, there's a lot of a lot of strategy behind that. So I think, first off, don't tell yourself stories. There are plenty of people out there that buy art. The reality is if you paint 50 paintings a year, all you need is 50 people or maybe 25 people to buy two or maybe four people. I I walked into a gallery one time. The gallery owner said, see that guy over there? I said, yeah. He said, he walked in. He went, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. Six paintings so far he's bought. He didn't even ask the price, right? So you just never know. And so the, the key is you got to be present. You got to be there where people can see you. Manage your thinking about stories. Don't get negative. There's plenty of business out there. There's plenty of business out there, even in a bad economy. And, and there are people out there who are spending money like drunken sailors, even though not everybody is, because it depends on how much money you have. So anyway, that's today's Art Marketing Minute. This has been the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes. You can learn more at artmarketing.com. I just want to remind you to join us at the Plein Air Convention. Camille Preswadic will be there, and you'll want to see her live and in person. Uh, Watercolor Live is coming up in January. You'll want to make sure you go to that. And also, please get a subscription to Plein Air Magazine. If you have not seen my blog where I talk about life and art, it's called Sunday Coffee, and you can find it at coffeewitheric.com and subscribe for free. And I'm on daily on Facebook and YouTube and I'm trying to get over that big, get that big number on YouTube and subscribers. It's called Art School Live. Look for it there and subscribe when you're there.
I'm Eric Rhodes, the publisher and founder of Plein Air Magazine, and know that it is a big world out there. Go paint it. We'll see you. Bye-bye. This has been the Plein Air Podcast with Plein Air Magazine's Eric Rhodes. You can help spread the word about Plein Air painting by sharing this podcast with your friends. And you can leave a review or subscribe on iTunes so it comes to you every week. And you can even reach Eric by email, eric at plenairmagazine.com. Be sure to pick up our free ebook, 240 Plein Air Painting Tips by some of America's top painters. It's free at plenairtips.com. Tune in next week for more great interviews. Thanks for listening.